crisis in housing affordability is one of the most talked about issues in the Bay Area today. And we're so glad to have Randy Suda, the President and CEO of Palo Alto Housing, with us today to talk about both what's happening in Palo Alto as the developer and manager of uh, affordable housing, as well as regionally. So Randy, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. You have quite the background. I was looking into your LinkedIn profile. Um, so you've been a city planner. You were the Director of Community Development in Mountain View and just accomplished a very large project there, the North Bay Shore right. plan. Mm -hmm. And now you're tackling affordable housing. You are at the epicenter of the epicenter <laughs> of the movement <laughs> right now to try to tackle this you know, really difficult um, problem that the region's facing. Um, maybe we can start with the Palo Alto housing project that the council just approved. Mm -hmm. um, that seems like it was a fairly uh, hard fought um, victory. Janani, I want to just ask you for a little bit of the background mm -hmm. because the, you know, working with the neighbors and trying to get something that was um, acceptable was pretty... Yeah, and I was talking to Randy right before the show about how shocked I was about how this debate went down. This was like a, almost, we could say Rand Randy's debut in Palo Alto that happened <laughs> January 14th, at least in City Hall. And um, Palo Alto Housing proposed a 59-unit um, affordable housing project with about a quarter of the units for adults with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And this is their first project since 2013, where voters famously knocked down in a referendum a zone change that was approved for their prior project. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I kind of come to expect, um, you know, a lot of acrimony, yeah. a lot of controversy, especially from yeah. people who live in the immediate area where a project is proposed. But that's not what we had. We had a lot of harmony. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of unanimity. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask from ask Randy, what did you guys do? What happened? <laughs> what was the difference between this and Maybell that led led the city to such a different outcome? Well, I think, in, in, in the, specifically for Wilton Court, I mean, a lion's share of the credit really needs to go to Cheryl Klein, our, uh, chair, our board chair. Mm -hmm. um, before I came aboard and after Kansas Gonzalez, the previous CEO left, Cheryl really stepped in to shepherd this project along. She's a Palo Alto resident. She understands Palo Alto issues in the community, and she did a fabulous job of uh, building those lines of communication with the neighbors and key stakeholders. And as we approached that, uh, that city council hearing, we really were, began to meet two-on-one -on -one and in small groups with uh, key neighborhood leaders to walk through some of the final issues and concerns that they had. And, and uh, you know, it was a... We, I really appreciated the spirit in which those neighborhood leaders engaged us. It was all about here are the concerns, are there ways that you as Palo Alto Housing can help address those? And I think we, uh, we were collectively able to come, come to resolution on, on, these, on the, those key issues, and that's what you saw in, at the city council meeting. But with affordable housing, I feel like some of these concerns could be quite tricky to resolve because you need a certain amount of density and height to make the project economical, and that's usually kind of like the sticking point. And with this project, Wilton Court, early on in the process, we heard the same kind of arguments sure. from neighbors as elsewhere. This is too big. But you guys, so how did you, how were you able to kind of get a good resolution on kind of getting people to be okay with the size of the building, the density, mm -hmm. those kinds of issues? How did you resolve it? Well, I, you know, we did agree to uh, reduce the number of units a little bit. And with the design of the project, it steps down from four stories on El Camino to three stories on the back side of the project that abuts the residential neighborhood. But I think importantly, it it's steps down to three stories, but it's also pulled back away from, that, uh, from the back of the project. So rather than having a box, a four-story box, if you will, what we did on the back side is incorporate uh, an outdoor patio area, a gathering space. Mm -hmm. um, so that creates an amenity uh, for our residents. It creates an additional buffer uh, between our project and the residential neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other part of what we did is, is, is really um, in order to help address some of the traffic and parking concerns and address a real need in Palo Alto was to increase the number of units that we were, were, will allocate for adults with developmental disabilities. So I think it's a, it's a, a big need for that kind of housing here in Palo Alto. It, generally those residents don't drive. Um, 
So through that, that mechanism, we, we were able to alleviate some of the concerns about parking. Mm -hmm. um, now that you have the approval, is the funding all there? Are you just ready to, to move forward with this project? Or is there anything, what's the work to be done you know, moving forward? Um, we need to formally get the, have the council allocate roughly $10 million of local funding from Palo Alto to the project. You heard them mention this and talk about it, acknowledge it in the yeah. public hearing. Um, the mayor said he will do it. I mean, it's, yeah. gonna, it's pretty much a done deal. So we need to formally get that done. Yeah. We have a gap of roughly $3 million right now. We don't have a dedicated funding source specifically for the uh, units with a, uh, for adults with developmental disabilities. We are uh, hoping to work with the County of Santa Clara uh, to secure that funding. Um, with that um, and tax credit funding and, all, and, and some of the additional sources like that, we hope to get it fully funded and proceed into construction sometime early next year. Okay. And this is the first project that's using this, uh, with this new zoning mechanism that Palo Alto created, the affordable housing overlay, which basically gives zoning c concessions uh, for projects that are 100% affordable housing. To what extent did this new zone change contribute or make this project possible? And, and also, are there any other kinds of zoning mechanisms that you think um, Palo Alto should pursue to help create more Wilton Court style projects? Well, the project wouldn't have happened without the affordable housing overlay. So credit to the City Council and the City of Palo Alto for, uh, for adopting that mechanism. Um, between the, the height that's allowed, the reduced parking requirements, setback uh, requirements, things like that. Even the retail on the ground floor. Yeah, the r waiver of the, the ground floor retail requirement. Those are all key components of making affordable housing and specifically Wilton Court successful. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think kudos to the city for, for moving forward with that overlay. Are there any kind of zoning laws that currently exist in Palo Alto that you see as like a major barrier to those kinds of projects that you think the council should consider maybe relaxing next? Or, 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 or are you happy with the way things stand? With the HA zone, AH overlay in place, do you think uh, zoning is where it needs to be now for... Housing. Well, of course, you know, as an affordable builder of affordable housing, you know, you uh, you always wish or hope that, that things would get even more streamlined, not only here in Palo Alto, but any other community in which we build. We're talking uh, about approval processes? So, so the so approval process, approval. of course. Yeah. Um, so, but I think the that, that overlay is a key component of that. Um, I think, you know, the degree to which that concept of allowing additional height and density in key areas along transit corridors and next to the Caltrain stations uh, can really open up opportunities for additional projects in Palo Alto. We should point out the council is going to discuss that again on Monday for Cal Avenue. Yeah. Um, as a nonprofit, is Palo Alto Housing allowed to um, lobby, shall I say, <laughs> give your opinion about what policies should be enacted in different cities? Are you allowed to proactively? meet with council members or, or whoever the decision makers are? Or as a nonprofit, is there some sort of an inhibiting factor there? No, I mean, we, we participated in the, that housing ordinance process. We testified in front of the, the city council, gave our recommendations and, and gave support to a lot of the key concepts. So you know, that's one of the roles of, of, of my position as the CEO is to be that voice of uh, Palo Alto Housing, but also voice for affordable housing in general. Yeah. I know you can support housing or, or policies that maybe have been proposed. Can you also give ideas and say, this is what we think you should do because this would, you know, enable yeah. affordable housing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, you've said that land is a big challenge. Um, what creative ideas are there out there for freeing up more land, whether that's public land or some sort of public-private partnership? How can we get more places to build? Well, land is one of the key challenges, um, and, and, and just so you know, the viewers understand, in many instances, we, to, we have to compete for land with for-profit developers, too. So, you know, if, if a site is on the market um, and we go after that site, we are putting a bid on it just like anybody else is. So, um, 
it's a very competitive landscape, as you're all aware of. That's why, it, it, from our standpoint, it's critical that local agencies really leverage the resources that they have in terms of publicly owned land, where it's available, where we can partner with agencies to um, perhaps put housing on parking lots or next to uh, rail stations, things like that. Anytime we have an opportunity like that, uh, it allows us to get access to that land without having to compete with the uh, mark the market rate mm -hmm. the developers for that land. Mm -hmm. Was the Wilton Court uh, project uh, privately owned, and yes. then they chose chose Palo Alto Housing, right. basically? Yeah, we actually oh. purchased it a number of years ago, mm -hmm. and have held it until recently. So this month, it seems like, has been a fairly big one for housing discussions regionally and announcements of money <laughs> being poured into. So there's, there was the CASA Compact, the regional um, consortium that's trying to make a dent through is that $1 billion in funding is the mm -hmm. idea um, over nine counties. Um, the Partnership for the Bay's Future, which has um, been spearheaded by... Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, $500 million they're trying to raise for affordable housing as well. You were at a housing solutions forum this morning. Um, are you heartened by all these discussions and efforts, or do you feel like, oh, this is just a drop in the bucket? No, I think it's, it's a tremendously encouraging sign, uh, starting with some of the legislation and the attention that uh, Sacramento began paying to housing a few years ago. Um, with the governor's budget message um, a, a couple weeks ago and his pledge to dramatically increase funding for affordable housing and a broad range of buckets of funding, you know, including moderate income, you know, funding for moderate income housing, et cetera. So, um, and then, you know, just yesterday, the CZI announcement, it's, it's tremendous news. Um, there's, it feels like there is a real groundswell of support politically and uh, from a funding standpoint in a way that we have not seen since the demise of redevelopment agencies. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's critical this happens. It, it's, I think it's important to have a little perspective um, that you know, the, the governor's budget really replaces what happened when, re, when redevelopment powers were taken away. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that this is getting us back to where we were, say, in 2008. It's a great thing to do, and we fully support the governor's efforts. Um, we're certainly, uh, affordable housing developers will certainly be able to put these funds to use, uh, but there's much more to be done. I feel like the funding is one component, but wasn't, hasn't the governor also been talking about possibly withholding transportation funds from cities that don't meet their housing obligations? Uh, I'm curious what, you, what you're thinking is in that proposal, given that so many cities in the area believe that transportation is precisely the prerequisite you need to have housing, uh, other, like to avoid traffic jams. Uh, do you think this kind of uh, stick approach could be effective to kind of spur the kind of housing production that the governor wants? Um, I, I, I think it's part of the solution. Um, it, you know, I think for years the complaint... And the criticism of California's housing laws is that there was it really lacked an enforcement mechanism. Right? Mm -hmm. How do you get communities that aren't uh, willing to abide by state laws, aren't willing to approve housing or affordable housing? How do you uh, how do you actually get them to comply with the intent of those laws? Mm -hmm. you know, last year, and uh, the state announced that they were going to get much more aggressive about that. And certainly, uh, with the governor's proposal, uh, he, for the first time, he's really talking about uh, uh, withholding transportation funds. Now, how that all works, it's not mm -hmm. really clear. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think uh, there's a lot more to come, uh, and a lot more details to understand. But, but don't you also run a risk that if you kind of ramp up the enforcement, you're going to alienate some of the local officials that you kind of whose help you might need to kind of build housing in local communities, as well as the population. I mean, if the government forces you to build a development that the voters later overturn, like, what, what good is it? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and, and I feel like this argument kind of came up during the, uh, the CASA compact discussions. Uh, you, know, you, you were part of the technical group that came up with this document mm -hmm. that basically includes everything from rent stabilization to kind of more housing to using right. publicly available lands. So I guess my question is, how do you balance this, this, these kind of 
concerns of local communities to retain control with the scope of the housing crisis and the need to spur housing. Uh, is there a way to balance it, or is it just one of those cases where local communities, you've had your chance, you didn't do it, so it's time to be the bad cop? Is, 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 there, is there an area of compromise between those two values? Well, I think, you know, an important part of what the governor's proposed and part of the CZI proposal is to allocate funds that are specifically for public agencies, mm -hmm. not only to reward agencies that are doing the right thing by approving, affordable, uh, approving housing and meeting their targets, but also setting aside funds that will help these local agencies get their plans, whether they're the general plans or get their zoning codes updated and in, 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 in the right form. Get, give them the funding, give them the staff such that they can proactively adopt these policies in a way that works for their local communities. I mean, if, if we put enough funding, um, we make enough funding available for these agencies and the agencies are able to take advantage of those funds, then I think we're in, a, we're in, in an ideal solution, right? Where it's less about imposing or mandating and more about encouraging communities to craft uh, their plans and create a vision that works for and is tailored for their individual jurisdiction. So more carrots, less sticks. I think, I think you need both. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a former you know, local official, mm -hmm. um, I think the agencies have been asking for carrots for a long time, whether mm -hmm. it's money, whether it's support for staffing. There's a lot of communities that simply can't get the staff, can't afford to hire the consultants to mm -hmm. update their plans. Mm -hmm. And... So in a situation like that, if you're an affordable housing developer wearing my current hat, mm -hmm. you know, that creates a friction point. We have to go in, apply for those zone changes or general plan amendments. It adds more mm -hmm. complexity to the process. Mm -hmm. or rather than a situation where you have an up-to-date plan, we can propose something that is consistent with that vision. We know what the community is looking for. So I think that, you know, that the carrot of making significant funding available for local agencies is, is really key. Mm -hmm. I know that um, local agencies are the drivers and the facilitators for affordable housing, um, but there's been a lot of talk about, hey, the employers are the ones who are bringing the people in, you know, they're clogging up the streets, shouldn't they be the ones paying for housing, like, on their campuses or, or nearby? And I'm just kind of wondering about that idea, the feasibility, and if, you, you know, your ear is to the ground, are you hearing companies say, yeah, we absolutely accept this responsibility, we're going to build housing? I mean, where are we at in that? Kind of well, I think, I, I think local companies are increasingly um, acknowledging uh, their responsibility or their support financially for, uh, for housing. Um, you know, LinkedIn has, has invested roughly, I think it's $15 million into the Housing Trust Tech Fund far in advance of when they would have been obligated to do that, years in advance, in fact. Um, you've got Google that is proposing uh, thousands of units in the North Bayshore area to help implement the North Bayshore plan. Facebook has committed funding for, for affordable housing. And then, of course, through CZI, not only did they help craft this, uh, this initiative, but they are also um, pledging money uh, to help invest in, in housing, affordable housing specifically. So. Um, you know, I can, there's other examples out there, right? Yeah. The Microsoft investment in Seattle, yeah. Cisco and Pure Storage and LinkedIn's commitment to help alleviate homelessness. So you're increasingly seeing these companies get involved, mm -hmm. uh, vocally support these initiatives and in, invest in them. Mm -hmm. What was it like working with these companies when you were putting together the North Bay Shore Plan? Because I'm, I'm thinking like in Palo Alto in 2013, in 13, there was this big fight over 60 units in Maybell. Mm -hmm. Your yeah. plan, the one that you helped create, that's like almost 10,000 housing units. Uh, what was the response like from the commercial entities in the North Bayshore area? And uh, basically, what were the lessons that you learned out of that process that you could take into your new role? Well, I think the great thing about the North Bayshore uh, process is that that idea was born from the community. It had nothing to do with city staff originally, nor did it have something to do with Google. It started, the whole, that whole process started in the summer of 2008 at a general plan visioning session when 600 members 
of the Mountain View community came together to really begin to answer the question, what do we want Mountain View to be in 2030? And one of the challenges they laid out is, hey, city, why don't you look at putting housing in North Bayshore? It's where all the jobs are. That's where all the people commute into in the morning. Doesn't it make sense to put some housing out there? And so that was the seed that was planted in the summer of 2008. So frankly, everything that we did after that was an outgrowth of that original idea that the community laid out. So it was really a, pro it was a process of, of carrying that vision forward, testing the ideas. You know, nobody, no jurisdiction in this particular area has ever, ever tried to reposition an office park into a complete oh. neighborhood on this scale. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of lessons learned. There weren't any good models for us to follow. Um, but, you know, it was a process of, of ensuring we had alignment with Google, with a lot of the housing advocates, with the residents, and, and certainly having the political support and will to do that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, actually, you joined Palo Alto Housing last year. I kind of wanted to, I was curious to know a little about your decision to become CEO of Palo Alto Housing after Candace Gonzalez's departure, and, and also about some of the plans that Palo Alto Housing has for projects. I know that since 2013, um, your organization has built some housing in Redwood City and Mountain View, in both cases around 60 units, and now you guys have Wilton Court. Uh, what else is in, in your sights, or are you just laser focused on this right now? <laughs> well, it's a big year for us in that... Uh, um, it's only January. <laughs> and it's only January. And, you know, with the Wilton Court approval, right, the first project to get approved uh, here for us mm -hmm. in, in, since Maybell. In, uh, in early March, we hope to be breaking ground on a project in San Mateo County. That will be our first affordable project uh, in, in San Mateo County. That will be in the North Fair Oaks oh, great. community. How, how, many, how many units is that? Uh, that one's roughly 70 also. Okay, uh, and then right on the heels of that, in, in early April, we hope to be complete with our first project in Mountain View. That's the Eagle Park project on El Camino. It's another 71 units or so. Is that the one for veterans? Or? Yeah, a portion of that will be for, for veterans. Um, and then not to mention, on February 26th, we hope to be in front of the Mountain View City Council for approval of a, uh, approval of a project on the old Taco Bell site on El Camino. So, you know, this is only the first four months of, of 2019 that I've sketched out. So we have a, we have a pretty ambitious agenda for, for this year. Uh, we'll continue to look for additional opportunities to build housing in southern San Mateo County, northern Santa Clara County. We'd love to do another project here in, in Palo Alto. Sounds like it's quite a honeymoon period. Were you, were you daunted coming in here given the history of Palo Alto housing in 2013? Did, did you think it would be really difficult to get anything passed since Maybell? Well, certainly, you know, I was very much aware of what happened in, in Maybell and, and being in a neighboring community, it was hard to escape you know, a lot of the media coverage from that. Um, you know, I've been, I was really pleased at the way the Ventura neighborhood helped support our project at Wilton Court. I think it, it, it we got, ended up in a good place. I think the neighborhood got into a good place and, and certainly their support at the city council meeting was tremendous. Uh, we feel very positive about how this process concluded, and, and it's really made us excited and look for opportunities to keep doing more work here. So some reason for optimism. I have almost one kind of conceptual question, because I feel like on the Palo Alto City Council, one of the kind of persistent debates is, should the council support housing of all sorts, or mm. of all types of housing, or should it focus on affordable housing, knowing that affordable housing requires much more public resources? So as somebody who's been involved in this Field for a long time. Is it possible, in your view, to make a dent in affordable housing without also allowing a lot of market rate housing that, whose profit could be used to subsidize that? Is it possible for a city to encourage only affordable housing, in other words? You know, my view of it is that the Bay Area needs housing of all types. Um, we need above market rate housing, we need moderate income housing, we need below you know, moderate income housing. We need housing of all types for all populations. You know, there, for 30 years, the region as a whole has undersupplied housing. So I think at this point, my belief is that we need every type of housing. 
Um, I don't think, I don't believe that we can build our way out of this crisis by only focusing on the market rate. In other words, I don't think by solely focusing on production of market rate housing will it bring the cost of uh, housing down to levels that uh, the lo lower income households can afford those on their own without subsidy. I don't see us getting to that point. We can't mm -hmm. possibly have that much supply. Right. 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 right, not after decades of undersupply. We have so far to go to dig ourselves out of this this crisis that, you know, I think for the immediate term and medium term, we're going to need to focus on building the total quantity of housing, but also f uh, focus very strongly on moderate and moderate and low-income housing. Well, the housing issue continues. We could talk for hours on this, <laughs> um, but our time is up and we need to wrap. But thank you so much, Randy, for being our guest today and sharing of your course. insights on housing. We wish you the best with the funding for the court. All right. Thank you very much. Um, that wraps up this edition of Behind the Headlines. Uh, to follow Palo Alto News or to talk about Palo Alto News, go to paloaltoonline.com or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you want to be up to date on when these uh, webcasts are released, then go to the uh, subscribe button below and click it. We'll see you next week.